Hello and welcome to our presentation today on how to architect your WebRTC application. I'm Aaron Syme, I'm the CEO and founder at WebRTC Ventures. I'll be joined today by my colleague Alberto Gonzalez, our CTO at WebRTC Ventures. And we're going to talk with you a little bit about what we've learned about how to build WebRTC applications, specifically the different types of architectures you need to consider in building your live video application using WebRTC. A little bit of background on us first, WebRTC Ventures is a custom design and development agency that specializes in building live video applications for web and mobile using the WebRTC standard. And we've worked with clients around the globe in a wide range of industries and use cases and technology stacks. And so what we're gonna do in this presentation is uh, give you some of the things you need to consider when architecting your WebRTC application based on our range of experience over the uh, last number of years. And uh, the, 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 the bad news up front for you perhaps is that there is no single WebRTC application architecture you should be looking at. There's no uh, simple solution or, or, or single answer that we're going to give you in this presentation. It's really about considering a lot of different factors. Uh, certainly the use case that you have for your application is very important. Uh, the budget that you have uh, is important. The, um, uh, the type of development team that you have, the technology stack you wanna work with, the experience you have in live video and WebRTC, all of these things come together into helping you choose what is the correct architecture for your specific scenario. So we're not gonna present you a single architecture uh, today that, that everyone should be looking at. We're gonna give you a, uh, a view into those different considerations that you need to think about and also talk about some sample architectures for specific use cases. And then hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a pretty good idea of the different types of paths you, you need to look into in a little more detail as you architect your WebRTC application. And if you want to know more about us, you can go to our website at webrtc.ventures, follow us on Twitter at WebRTC Ventures. We'd certainly be happy to talk to you more about your application and, and how our team might be able to help you in building that. So our agenda today, I'll start out by talking a little bit about why it's not so easy to build WebRTC applications and the first uh, important thing that you need to consider in your architecture, which is do you want to go with a more open source solution or do you want to go with one of the commercial media server solutions? And there's some important considerations there that you need to think about. Then after that, Alberto will join us and he'll talk to you about the different types of media servers that you may encounter in architecting your WebRTC application. And he'll go through a few use cases, a few of the most common use cases that we see and show you some sample architectures for that and talk about the pros and cons of that. So that should give you a pretty solid idea by the end of this of the range of options that you can consider in architecting your WebRTC application. So when you first learn about WebRTC, you often see a diagram that looks something like this one here, where you have two peers, two different people in browsers on a laptop, on a computer, who are connecting to each other. They have to connect through some sort of a signaling server. There has to be some sort of messages exchanged between them just to help establish the connection between them. But once you've established that connection, then all of the heavy traffic, all of the stuff you really care about, the video, the audio, the data channels, that those are all exchanged directly between those two browsers in a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. And uh, so that sounds really great, right? Your signaling server that, that helps establish the connection is not really carrying a lot of traffic um, and uh, it's not handling the, the video data itself. So there's some, there's some uh, great advantages to this idea of peer-to-peer -peer WebRTC, sort of the simplest model and the one that we most hear talked about in WebRTC. You're not putting very much load on the servers the traffic, the video and audio traffic, the data traffic is not going through those servers. So that also means that you can have um, a, a little more assurance of security, that there's no third party watching uh, the video call, things like that. The, uh, those peer-to-peer -peer channels for video, audio, and data are all encrypted in transit as, as part of the WebRTC standard. This should work in any modern browser uh, and just with JavaScript. 
calls, basically. So it's a really beautiful vision for uh, WebRTC and, and is uh, deceptively simple. And I say deceptively simple because for most of your use cases, uh, this is probably not what you're going to do anymore, or at least it's not what you're going to do in all scenarios, let's say, right? So if you have a, a relatively simple use case where you have two peers connecting in a video call and they, they aren't doing anything special with that video call, you have a pretty high confidence of, of open network connections, of strong network connections, you're not doing any other features around that, um, you're using modern browsers, you know, kind of a, an ideal scenario, then WebRTC may actually be just as simple as that first tutorial that you read about it. Uh, but there is a lot more to it that tends to make it much more complicated for people and why it's not quite as easy to build with as that initial tutorial will lead you to believe. The first is that you definitely need some stun and turn servers. So that stun server is going to help establish that peer-to-peer -peer connection and then the turn server helps you to relay video and audio data in cases where a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection cannot be established between the two parties. Uh, so this is something that you know starts to get in, starts to show the complexity of building WebRTC. It might be the first problem that you encounter when you build a WebRTC application based on a simple tutorial is realizing that you know it worked between these two computers on my home network. Uh, but then when I put it out there in the real world, sometimes people can't connect. And that's probably due to stun and turn server configurations or, or lack of having them in, in the application. So that's the first thing people start to realize. But there's a lot of other things too that you'll encounter where you start to realize WebRTC is not that simple. Uh, maybe dealing with video codecs in the browser. Um, maybe you're trying to do group chat. So you know having more than a couple of participants in the call, you start to run into some issues with the complexity of scaling that to large group chats. Or maybe you start to run into some issues and incompatibilities between browsers or desktop versus mobile. It's a lot better than it used to be, but there still are incompatibilities there at times. <clears throat> or maybe you're trying to use other features beyond just the video chat itself. For example, a very common one would be recording. You want to record this video call for some reason. Well, that uh, pretty much rules out the simplest WebRTC peer-to-peer -peer architecture. You're going to have to start to get media servers involved for things like recording or any sort of machine learning or captioning or, or AI or, or video um, augmentation that you want to do uh, to the video live. All of that is going to start to require some sort of other media server in the middle and you get away from this, this uh, simple peer-to-peer -peer scenario in WebRTC. So at a high level, there's three different ways that you might start to build your WebRTC application. The first is, is basically building to the WebRTC standard itself. In, in other words, you're building your own stack. Um, and then the second is utilizing open source media servers. And then the third is looking at the commercial media servers, the CPaaS, as the communication platforms as a service. So we're going to look at uh, the pros and cons of each of these a little bit. So first, if you want to build directly to WebRTC standard, you want to build your own stack, you have the most power, you have the most flexibility in the way you implement it, you can optimize it the most for your specific use case. So depending on your scenario, this may be a great way to go. If you have a really unique use case, you have particular conditions you need to optimize for, particular features maybe in the latest version of WebRTC or other things like web codecs that you want to start to incorporate in your application that are maybe not exposed to you through the open source or the commercial options, then building your own WebRTC stack is a great way to go. But it does also come with a lot of responsibility. You have to basically handle everything. You may need to uh, recompile the WebRT Live WebRTC um, and if, if you're making any changes in there, then you've got to manage that complexity. You've certainly got to handle the stun and turn servers that I mentioned previously. You may have to deal with the different codecs, direct, codecs directly. Um, all of the different scaling issues, you're going to have to handle everything about scaling beyond a two-person peer-to-peer video chat. And that can get quite complex depending on the scenario. And, and how you scale is different if you're scaling for lots of conversations in parallel, or you're scaling for broadcast scenarios, or you're scaling for large group chats, those are all different types of scaling and you have to handle that 
uh, entirely yourself in here as well as any other features that you want like recording. So there's a lot of possibilities here and you get to use some of the latest APIs like Web Codecs in that that may be really important in your use, use case, but you do need to you know, realize that uh, this is gonna be a lot more complex than probably that first tutorial you read about WebRTC. So next option that uh, people will look at is using an open source media server. The great thing about going with an open source media server is it's gonna handle a lot of that complexity for you, but because it's open source, you still have a lot of opportunity to uh, really get into maybe some lower level configurations or write your own add-ons to that open source project and incorporate you know, that back into the community. Uh, so there's a lot of um, advantages to doing an open source media server. It's gonna handle maybe part or all of the signaling for you. It's probably got stun and turn included or at least has you know, some recommendations for how to handle that. It's probably got some scaling built into it already. You need to make sure it's you know, optimized for the type of scaling you're gonna do. Um, it can involve multiple different types of media servers like SFUs and MCUs that Alberta will talk about. It's incorporated most of the browser and mobile support that you already need. And then this is the last one here is kind of a pro and a con depending on your perspective, but you have to, you have to control and manage all of the infrastructure. So you're taking this open source project, you're putting it on your cloud infrastructure um, and that's great. That gives you a lot of control over it. Uh, gives you a lot of flexibility in how you handle the scaling of it and the cost of it and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but it does still mean some extra work that you have to manage that infrastructure. There are a number of popular open source media servers that you can consider. Listed a few here like Janus and Jitsi and MediaSoup and Pion. Um, one of the things when looking at these is to think about what language is it built in? Janus is in C, Jitsi in Java, MediaSoup, C++, Pion is in Go. So depending on your technology stack, your development preferences, you might choose one of these libraries over another based on that, or based on the features that it offers, based on the plugins and libraries that it has available to you, based on the community support it has. There's lots of different considerations as with any open source project of which one you wanna to go to. These are some of the most popular ones to take a look at. So our final uh, high-level architectural choice is to consider using a commercial media server, a CPaaS, a communication platform as a service. This is kind of the, the most out-of-the-box solution that you can use. It's gonna handle all WebRTC support and updates for you. You don't have to worry so much about browser compatibilities. It's gonna have media servers built into it. It's definitely handling the stun and the turn server configuration for you. Um, web and mobile support typically in different libraries and it's going to have lots of other added on features like recording or if you want SIP and telephony integration, uh, transcription libraries, things like that. So this is going to be a pretty complete solution that offers you a lot of options and in theory at least should be your fastest route to market because they've wrapped up all this functionality for you. It comes at a cost of course. Um, you know the good thing here is that these companies uh, who do this, uh, and these are some of the popular examples that you'll see for CPASSes that, that we've worked with, and there are others out there as well. Any of these companies, they have teams of experts, expert engineers in their company that do nothing but manage how to make their CPASS scale on a global network, right? So that sort of thing, you're gonna get some great scaling right out of the box that you didn't have to worry about by using any of these. So that's a wonderful aspect of going with a CPASS. The downside is that you're gonna pay for these things. You're generally paying based on usage. Uh, the different CPASS providers have different plans and sometimes the way they charge for usage is a little bit different. So here again, you really need to think about your very specific scenario, your use case, the type of calls you're typically gonna have. Are you broadcasting? Are you doing large group video chats? What are the features that you need? Are you recording? That's typically gonna be an extra cost. So take a look at the features you're really gonna utilize and make sure you compare across those CPASSes. How are you typically going to be charged for those for your specific scenario? that may help drive which one you want to go with, or maybe it's something about their particular network or um, the libraries that they support, the languages that they have supported libraries for. 
lots of things to consider here as well, but, uh, but certainly that's an option. And so the last thing I'll say here before I turn it over to Alberto is just kind of pointing out the trade-offs between these. So some of the different trade-offs that you're gonna make are, are you more concerned about upfront cost? In other words, are you trying to reduce the amount of development time necessary, the amount of money you have to spend on a, a development company like us or on your own team or uh, either the money you spend or just the time that they need to work. If that's the most important consideration for you, then building your own stack is probably going to be the most expensive option, the most time consuming option. Using one of those commercial media services is probably going to be your fast, uh, the most fast to market. Uh, and therefore the least expensive option, but it really does depend on your use case. You might find there's one of the open source media servers fits your use case so well that they're gonna be faster to market to, to use that. Um, or maybe it's not the upfront cost that matters to you so much, it's the ongoing cost, right? Because as you scale, if you're using one of those commercial solutions, your costs are gonna go up perhaps dramatically as you scale. And so maybe it's really important to you if you're really confident you're gonna be at high scale fast with your application, then you need to consider perhaps one of the open source solutions where you control the infrastructure, you're not paying a markup on that for management of it. You're gonna to have to manage everything about the scaling, so it can be very costly in terms of your engineering team, but at least the transactional cost of each call is not going to be as expensive as a commercial solution may be. Um, or you may need to consider, you know, what is the easiest solution for you to do? Uh, perhaps you have a very small technical team or you're a startup and you have limited access to developers uh, or budget to hire developers with expertise in this. So you may want to consider that, you know, again, building your own stack is probably going to be the highest technical difficulty there, require the most expertise. You're going to be reinventing the wheel a little bit, whereas those C passes and, and then also the the depending on your use case, the, the open source media server solutions, uh, they may have already solved these problems for you, right? So they're gonna be a little lower technical difficulty. And then looking at, you know, what are the specific features included for your use case is really important. So as I said at the beginning, there's no specific architecture that we can recommend to you in this. There's lots of this different things that you need to consider. So far, we've just talked about the differences between building your own WebRTC stack, using a, an open source media server solution and using a commercial solution as the backbone of your stack. But there's a lot more still to consider. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alberto Gonzalez, our CTO at WebRTC Ventures, who's gonna to talk to you a little more about some architectural considerations and then offer up some different uh, example architectures based on different use cases that you can consider. Hi, thanks for the introduction. As Aaron mentioned, building your own WebRTC library can be complex. Also, a native peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication using WebRTC is a very beautiful idea, but can get complicated when you want to scale to numbers above three to five participants. Open source implementations and media servers can help simplify those issues with scalability. As I can show uh, in this diagram, um, it c can get quite complicated if, if you want to um, support multiple participants and you don't have a media server in between. And it's not only the, um, the complexity, but more of the issues in terms of uh, performance that this can have. So let's look at um, the alternatives. Um, here I mentioned the two most popular um, approaches uh, or architectures uh, to build uh, your WebRTC applications. The, the, the first one is the MCU or multi-point multi control unit. It handles the mixing uh, in the server. So basically as a user, I publish media and that is mixed together with all the media of all the participants in the server and I get back a single stream with all that mix of streams. The other approach, that's the uh, selective forwarding unit architecture, um, is uh, lately has become more popular and this one is uh, uh, works as follows. Um, you publish the stream and that go reaches the media server 
and that media server uh, distributes that same stream to the rest of participants. Uh, in that case, uh, if there are three participants, I would be getting two streams down to my client and I would be publishing uplink one. Um, each of those architectures uh, provide benefits uh, in comparison with the native mesh uh, architecture and is that you are capable of implementing recording in the server, other more advanced functionalities uh, in, in the server like broadcasting, uh, integra integrations with uh, VoIP legacy systems and, and things like that. So let's get deeper into MCU. So the, the MCU architecture um, mixes, as I was saying, audio and video. Each, uh, each participant will only get two streams. And the, the benefit of that, obviously, is that we are not going to get um, or need that much bandwidth because we just have two streams. So that's the best case for clients that are um, lacking bandwidth or CPU because they are just handling two streams. On the other hand, this is pretty CPU intensive on the server, so it's typically more, more costly to, to support. And here we mentioned some uh, pretty popular alternatives uh, that are open source uh, for um, uh, building your MCU architecture for your WebRTC app, like FreeSuite, Currento, or Frozen Monte. Then there is the, the SFU, SFU architecture, where, as I was saying, um, you publish one stream, but you get the rest of the streams down to you. In that case, um, the, the client needs to be a bit more effort because it's decoding uh, multi, more streams than in the previous case but um, the server is also um, doing less effort. The benefit also of this case is that we can uh, control, a, m have a more control on where, uh, what we do with each video stream and, and in the previous case uh, in the MCU the, that grid of video streams comes already um, defined by the media server which of course can be configured. Um, and yeah, this, uh, this alternative um, allows for end-to-end -end encryption as well, although um, that's a pretty recent um, implementation. And two very popular um, media servers, open source media servers, um, are Jitsi and Janus, but there, there are others. So also, uh, I wanted to add this, this note that presented Lorenzo a year ago um, at the IIT RTC where um, you actually uh, could have both alternatives together, why not? Um, and that's a perfectly valid case for situations where, for example, you would want um, a video conferencing application, typical in this case we are showing like five participants, but you might want as well to have uh, a voice call coming from the PSTN network, like from a mobile phone, and join the, the video room. In that case, you might want to have like an MCU that mixes the audio streams there, and then passes uh, that to the SFU. Or for some reasons, if the codecs, um, uh, th there are some uh, incompatibilities between codecs, you could decide to use an MS MCU also to do transcoding or other uh, potential reasons like for broadcasting. But um, let's talk now about some of the, the use cases uh, specifically where we could use an SFU and MCR uh, architectures. So the most straightforward um, use case is the one-to-one -one, uh, video call. Um, this is common in telehealth applications intercoms, um, remote control applications where you want to control a remote uh, machinery. Um, that's typically one-to-one -one and is probably the most tested and supported use case because that's 
uh, easier to test um, although of course there are there might be interoperability issues but in theory that's something that browsers put a lot of effort into um, some things to consider um, about this so you can build it just using native WebRTC peer-to-peer uh, or using some communication platform but this has some limitations as I was saying like um, first uh, there can be some restricted networks that require uh, turn servers so in that case you still would need some intermediate server to forward traffic and um, also it's kind of complicated to have uh, recorded built-in or tools like uh, things like broadcasting specifically if you have a web application um, you will be within the limits of the browser and typically there are some issues um, recording large files and so on so that um, can get quite complicated in a one-to-one -one, uh, architecture like this one the nice thing of this functionality is that pretty easy to implement end-to-end uh, -end encryption because it's out of the box so you don't need to do anything it's already end-to-end -end encryption encrypted and yeah here I just show how the architecture would look like in case where two clients wouldn't be able to connect and that's where you would need this called turn server to be able to relate the traffic um, so yeah that's one approach um, the other one uh, that we have uh, is the uh, gr group video chat pretty common uh, we have seen like solutions like Jitsi Google Meet, Zoom, all these um, type of applications usually uh, will leverage an SFU architecture um, some of the ones I mentioned don't but um, that's the most common approach uh, particularly because uh, for large amount of users you don't want uh, you want to reduce costs so the SFU architecture makes sense um, and also um, there are some things to consider here uh, you can build this using a communication platform or open source media server that is an SFU for example um, in this case if you choose to self-host it yourself using an open source media server um, you need to consider scalability of it um, you might need multiple uh, servers to host that because um, at some point uh, that SFU server might not be able to support more participants and that can be quite complicated and that's when one of the things can be more time consuming if think thoroughly if you really need dozens of participants in a video call because it's a big difference that versus a dozen of participants in a video call for example um, interoperability of course here is a bit more complex um, this is also more resource intensive we have more streams and here uh, things like simulcast and, and SVC uh, which are te techniques uh, or um, yeah, protocols that we can use uh, in this kind of um, architectures make a lot of sense uh, here we have the uh, a representation at the bottom of how SF SVC works and basically uh, how this technique what these techniques allows is us to stream a single to publish a single stream and that stream has multiple layers or qualities and then uh, each user based on their network and their resources can decide um, which type of quality they are capable of streaming so this is nice because it it will basically adapt to the yeah to the user and if the user can for example receive HD resolution that's what he would get but another user would uh, get the wherever other resolution is capable of so this is very adaptive and um, it's a very powerful technique and another thing is really consider if you need video um, currently lately there have been many platforms also just using audio and being able to they, they are being successful so um, that's a big difference um, we are talking about um, at least like 10x or 5x increase in bandwidth 
and and if you if you are going to use uh, video versus um, audio only, so that's a, a good consideration to have, and um, that limit of participants uh, will depend a lot on on that. Then we have the live interactive broadcasting use case. Um, that's also really popular um, in any kind of broadcasting solutions that need low latency. So as we can see in this image at the bottom, um, uh, there are some solutions out there that might use um, easier to use uh, technologies like HLS, RTMP, that can achieve closer to five seconds uh, latencies which might be okay for a free um, soccer match, but um, for situations where you are paying for a sports event, um, for gaming, and for maybe vetting applications or payments, you don't uh, want to deliver this super um, uh, experience. And that's where um, solutions built in WebRTC makes sense, and this is, would be the use, the, the types of use case. And uh, at the top, we can see a little bit the idea of in this diagram how the live interactive broadcasting works. Um, we see that uh, we have in this case two publishers. Um, we could have any type of architecture, um, maybe uh, perhaps a, an SFU server, and we would send. Um, that stream to perhaps 100 viewers and those viewers uh, would be uh, capturing that, that uh, video and audio but the interesting part also as well here is that these viewers can be brought in as publishers as well so that's the flexibility and the, the part the interactive part of this that you can um, because it's live and there is so, such a low latency you can combine and, and have publishers become viewers and viewers become publishers and interact between them. Um, it's, uh, as things to consider, it's uh, important to know that this is much more expensive than just a standard on-demand video streaming application, um, mainly because um, you can't cache your video because it's low latency and is something happening live so that is real-time traffic and you can save using cache um, um, the scalability of it is also a bit more complicated because um, yeah you can't use a, uh, you can't store that um, in cache and just have uh, users play that this needs to be redistributed live in multiple media servers so um, reaching thousands of participants with web RTC is not trivial versus other technologies. Uh, and in this case also simulcast and SVC, what I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, makes even more uh, sense uh, because here we have viewers with many different qualities, so we want to make sure we enable and we use these techniques. Um, another use case uh, that that is very popular and specifically in, in middle size or large uh, companies is uh, the contact centers. Um, this can be used for offering support, for marketing, um, things like that. And this, in this diagram I just show uh, on a high level how uh, one of the architectures in a contact center could look like in a very high level. So the the web publishers would be connecting to the MCU, which, as I explained before, would mix the streams, and this MCU uh, would uh, forward that uh, to the phone caller, or phone callee in this case. So we could have participants uh, joining from the PSTN network and from the web, and all together in a single call. So that would be a, a standard. Um, common approach. Um, another uh, type of diagram would be the, the one I show here where um, we will have an SFU for the website of things, so for the video conferencing, and then uh, we could have um, MCU or 
IPPBX to handle the phone calls for dialing in, for example, into a video room. That could be an example. Um, one important thing to consider here is the uh, video. Uh, if you really want to have video support, this is getting going to get much more complicated, particularly if you need to integrate with um, uh, VoIP or SIP legacy uh, networks. Um, that there are many differences uh, between different legacy networks, so that and um, the codecs can be also a problem. So that's an important thing to consider if you are integrating. Um, also, uh, recording voicemail and speech to text are pretty common uh, features in this type of use case. Um, typically, uh, the voicemail will be something that is more implemented in the uh, PBX, in the telephony side of things, um, but sometimes can be uh, implemented in the MCU as well or, or even the SFU. Another uh, typical um, functionality in this case is having IVRs or voice bots and where where you have like a kind of attendant and you route the user to specific um, uh, maybe a support person or help desk things like that so um, with uh, this uh, being the end of the presentation I would like to summarize uh, some of the tips uh, we talk about. Um, I think uh, first uh, decide what you are going to compromise is is the first one. Um, there is no perfect solution. There is no single architecture that is going to be perfect for for your use case. So you need to compromise. Uh, you need to decide. Um, if you want to compromise quality, latency, maybe battery life of the device, or even cost. So those are very important things to do uh, at the beginning of when architecting your application. Also, understand the three main ways to build your WebRTC app. Um, as Arin mentioned, you can build your own um, WebRTC library or leverage the the current Chrome WebRTC library, as uh, you might imagine, that's quite complex. It requires a lot of effort. Um, so you have also the alternatives of using existing open source implementations of the library or open source media servers and leveraging the browser, the browsers. Um, as third point. Uh, Remember to leverage the latest web RTC capabilities. And with that, uh, I mean things like uh, Simulcast, SVC that uh, I mentioned in previous slides, um, other configuration flags that are available in web RTC in the uh, newer updates, things like, for example, hints, which allows us to decide if we want to focus on the video um, picture quality or want to focus on having a dynamic video and more on the movement of that video. So there are um, many things that can be tweaked, uh, codecs as well, that um, you, um, yeah, you would need to, to make sure you are leveraging and, and configuring properly. And as the last one, uh, focus on your specific use case needs. Um, as I was explaining, there are many use cases. Each use case commonly uses um, one architecture, and sometimes they are um, better for. Uh, they are. Uh, we typically see uh, some some features implemented in those, but yeah, focus on on really what you need uh, because any additional functionality that you want to add. Um, if it's not what you need doesn't make sense, for example, if you are focused on an audio platform and you say, well, video would be nice, that's probably something that is not worth the effort um, because it's going to make things more complicated. So, yeah, um, here concludes 
um, the presentation architecting web RTC applications uh, if you are interested about these topics uh, please follow us at web RTC ventures uh, on Twitter and thank you for watching